Okay, our next speaker is Lester King, who I've known since he was in college, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, at TSU where he was where he got his PhD, and now is at the Shell Center for Sustainability, and has been thinking about this stuff for a pretty long time for such a young guy. Lester. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I especially wanted to say thank you for putting me on the agenda after Michael Emerson. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, you put me after Callaway. Very nice. And then I found out today that I had a 15-minute presentation to make in front of this distinguished audi audience. So um, what are my thoughts? My thoughts are I'm glad that David put together this, this wonderful panel of experts, um, consultants, making sustainability happen. And they're doing it all over the world. So this is something that everybody is sold on, the, the, the importance of doing this. What is the model that we're following here? What, what did these guys present to you? They presented to you, let's collect intelligence on how the city works. Let's, uh, let's take that data. Let's take that data and create something new. Let's create a model. Let's look at the connections between the data. And then let's, let's figure out how, how we are doing. Let's figure out how, how we do compared to other cities across the, the world and, the, and, and this country, of course. And then let's look at policy. Um, so basically what we're doing is, is taking intelligence and, and turning that into policy, intelligence into policy, not what people's normative opinions are on things, but we're taking facts and we're turning that into policy. And then we're going to use that policy to dictate how we actually grow and how we do things. And, and that's what I hope you guys take away from, from that distinct, these, these presentations that we heard this morning. Um, that's a wonderful model. And, and that model um, is, is, not, is not new, but, but uh, it's arguably new uh, for, for, for some of us in the room. And, and for Houston, it would be new. Um, consultants are very good at, at doing that now. We can trust that they will do that. We can also trust that you guys in this room are going to, as time goes on, you're going to become more efficient at your work or your jobs. You're going to, you're going to pull in the best practices from wherever you could find it because that's what you experts do and you public staffers do. You find the best of things to do. But what about the rest of the city? What about the people not in this room? What about Houston? When we talk about Houston, are we talking about us or are we talking about people who don't show up here today? Um, over the past year, I, I was at, on campus at Rice, um, arguably in the Ivy Tower, pulling together data from all kinds of databases across the city, right? Um, all kinds of departments, making people upset with my request for data, trying to understand what that intelligence is for Houston. And just to prove to you guys that I was listening to the presentations, I used, I used, uh, I used Scott's uh, uh, seven um, um, categories of, of things that he says are, uh, are ideal to target for sustainable development. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of the, the data that I pulled and how his categories actually look like, what, what they look like for our city. So in terms of buildings, you know, we, we're doing pretty well on buildings. In fact, we are becoming more efficient with our buildings. But that makes sense. Is that sustainability? I, I'm not so sure. I think it's a component of sustainability, but it does make sense that if you can save money on your bill, you're going to do that, right? You're going to make that building more efficient. Um, and, and LEED says, you know, if you do this, people are going to see that. They're going to come to your building. So, so they're making money by making buildings smarter and more efficient, which is good for sustainability. And that is a low-hanging fruit. And it's great for Houston. But we need AC in Houston. And unfortunately, um, we, we, we need to do LEED buildings, but we're still going to be adding to the energy load with more building development. In terms of transportation, um, less people use transit today or rather, less people don't travel alone in their cars today than, than back in 1990. Um, back in 1990, it was 28%. Today, it's, well, 2010, it was 25%. So that's a quarter of Houstonians using public transit, right? Um, in terms of power generation, we're using more energy per capita at home. Um, in 2000, it was 13, approximately 13,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, in 2010, it, it increased to 14,000, right? So we're using more energy. Um, in terms of land use, only 21% of housing units are located within a quarter mile of our business districts. 
um, what we're talking about is, is uh, concentrations, high concentrations of, of jobs across this city. We're not a centralized city. We don't just have downtown. We have 17 sub-centers across the, the city, actually. Um, and only 21% of housing units are within a quarter mile walk to those jobs, which means the rest of us have to drive there to, to work. Um, in terms of industry, we lost 10% of jobs between, 10% uh, of, excuse me, industrial jobs between um, 2000 and, and 2010. Um, however, we had medical center jobs increasing, so that helped to defray some of those losses. But industrial jobs bring in prime capital, and, and for that reason, we have to figure out how we can increase that indicator. Um, in terms of water, all of our streams are polluted. They all are polluted. And we, are, we have a, a move to surface water. So that's an area of grave concern. In addition, we are using more water today per capita as well. Back in 2000, it was 159 gallons a day per person. Uh, in 2010, it was 165 gallons per day. In terms of waste, we don't have curbside recycling at houses in, in this city, at all of the houses in this city, or most of the houses in this city, we don't. And we are asking people to pay more money um, to uh, have their yard trimmings removed from their home. That's the equivalent, actually, of a tax on recycling. And in places like Switzerland, you actually pay to have the regular stream moved from your home. The regular stream is not free. So if you do that, you're kind of incentivizing recycling over regular waste streams. So we do the opposite, um, uh, frankly, in Houston. In terms of housing, Scott, this was not on your list, but I included housing because it's very important here. We do a lot of development, and, and we think that's a prime driver of our economy. In 2010, we had 100,000 vacant housing units in the city. And our population is increasing approximately at 1.42% a year. Um, that's about 30,000 people. So I think I could fit that, those 30,000 into the already uh, you know, established 100,000 vacant housing units. Um, you know, that, that's, those are a few of, of the, um, the indicators that I put together in, in, in the database that we're producing on campus. And you know, the questions are, why do cities want to become sustainable? Why, why do mayors or governors, who, who makes that decision anyway? Um, you know, do cities even know what sustainability means? You know, when people say sustainability, what is that? What is the definition? People make up their own definitions of sustainability. Why are we here? Um, I, I would argue that if we were to stop before I get into that, let me just say that there is an opportunity. There's a bright light here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, about a year and a half ago or so through the uh, Houston APA, um, I invited David Godstock to come speak to the local planners. I am an urban planner. Um, and uh, we were talking about sustainability across the country. David worked on a panel to come up with a new uh, way to do comprehensive sustainability plan planning. So we're not talking about traditional planning. We're talking about urban planning, which is going to be sustainability planning. And he reformed the entire way that planning is supposed to be done across the country. And so we were asking him about Houston. We were talking about Houston. And, and he basically said he doesn't think we can do sustainability. Um, but most of us in the room were, were challenged. We, we weren't distraught. We were challenged with, and, and we, we, we left that session thinking to ourselves that what we need to do is to prove to the rest of the country that we can do it. We can do it here in, in Houston. We can do it here in the South. And, and that we want to do it because we get things done. Whatever, whatever we want, which is the important takeaway, we can get done. And, and I believe in that. I believe that whenever, um, Unfortunately, whenever we come to an important vote at the city level, we put the decision out to the voters. We say, well, let's, let the voters decide what, what, what they're going to do. And, and what I'd like to, to suggest is, is, is that's bordering on irresponsibility if the voters don't, are not knowledgeable about the thing they're voting on. Whereas we as experts and public staffers are educated. And so I'd like to end my, my, uh, my uh, uh, short talk by suggesting that if we had to stop all of the um, regional sustainability efforts and the city level um, sustainability efforts and put all of that money into educating the public and advocating for sustainability and educating those residents outside what sustainability is, 
I believe that we would see more rewards and we would get sustainability done. Callaway. Good. <laughs>